sin. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Most righteous Father, we thank you for the blood shed on the cross. Lord, we're just so grateful that you loved us enough. You loved us so much, Father, when we were in such an unlovable state that you were willing to subject yourself, a king, to subject yourself to the things you subjected yourself to. Lord, I pray that you help us so that we don't take those things for granted and that we're able to reciprocate the love you've shown to us by carrying out your mission for our lives. And Lord, I pray that the word that goes forward is perfect, even in the midst of my imperfections, so that we all can leave here transformed. And that's my prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He rescued me. He rescued me. I'm waiting on it. Did he rescue you today? Yes, he rescued me too. Amen. I didn't want to take it alone, but I was claiming it for myself, and I just need to know if I was the only one here. He rescued. Anybody got a testimony about how he rescued you today? Glory to God. He rescued us from darkness. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I was in a dark place for a long time. And I actually thought that I liked it there. I thought that I preferred to be there because what ended up happening was when I gave myself to darkness, he actually says this word that if you want it bad enough, I'll turn you over to it. Come on, somebody. And so after a period of time, my vision started to shift so that I could adjust and learn how to function in darkness. And so for a very long time, I thought I was in the right place. But the Bible tells us that there's a way that seems right to man, but surely leads to death. And I was in that place for such a long time. But then I had an encounter. On a night when I was hanging out and doing my own thing and I almost lost my life. I had an encounter. Sometimes we call out to Jesus because we're afraid. But then when we get out of that fearful situation, we don't call on him anymore. Y'all don't know what I'm, that's just me. That might not be y'all. That might not be y'all. But there was something different about this particular encounter when I'm staring death in the face and I'm looking at this gun that's aimed in my direction and I don't know who the person is or why it's aimed at me. I hadn't done anything wrong. I'm just out here trying to have a good time like everybody else. But in that moment, there was something in my heart that said, if you don't get your life right now, that fire will go off and be aimed at you. And when I screamed out for Jesus in that moment, the man who was aiming at me he put the gun down and he ran by me. So when you have an encounter, your vision starts to shift a little bit. See, I had an encounter with darkness and my vision shifted, but then I had an encounter with light. And it started to shift back to my first love. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. He pursued me with passion and mercy. And see, the mercy part came in because even though, and I'm being honest, because can I be transparent for a minute? Even though I had the encounter, there were still some issues I had to work out 
in my salvation. There were some issues I had to work out in my behavior. Y'all know what I'm saying? So he still continued to pursue me with the same level of passion, but I'm just so grateful that he brought mercy along with me. Because see, without the mercy, I wouldn't be standing here today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Mm, come on. So the reminder is that he went to the cross. He went to the cross for all of our sins. He went to the cross not only for the sins that we committed in the past, but the sins that we commit today and the sins we'll commit tomorrow. Are y'all getting this? What I'm trying to tell you is that there's nobody in here that's perfect. And no matter how much you love the Lord, you're going to make a mistake. And no matter how much you love the Lord, he knew that the mistakes you were going to make, he's got it all on the calendar. He's got, he's got an alarm set off. Okay, well, Freddie's going to mess up today at 2 o'clock. He knows. It's not going to surprise him what I'm going to do. Right? I'm not saying I'm claiming that I'm going to make mistakes, but there are some things that we just sip, you know, we fall into. It's just a reality. But he has a margin of error that he's given all of us. And within that margin, that's grace and there's mercy. And so knowing all of that, knowing that we're going to make mistakes that we know better than to make, he still said, I love you enough that I'm still going to the cross. Does anybody have a praise in the spirit for that? Because, see, if he really wanted to pick us off, he could have. He could have found anything. I'm sure the devil was in front of him with all of our sins, all of our faults, saying, see, this is what they did. And they know the scripture. They know better, but this is what they're doing. And they, and they had an opportunity to turn from it, but they didn't. So he had plenty of opportunity to take us out if he really wanted to, but he says no, because my passion is perfect. My grace is perfect, and it is sufficient. It's going to be enough to turn your life around. So he's given us that margin. And it's because of that, that's the only reason why he can make a promise to us that if we would just humble ourselves and pray and seek his face, that then he will hear from his Father in heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land. See, he can make that promise to us because of what he has already done on the cross. Jesus. And so today I want to focus on the sacrifice. We're going to talk about the resurrection, but I want to focus on the sacrifice. The reason why I want to focus on the sacrifice is because we can get so excited about the resurrection that we forget that he had to be crucified first. And I want to make sure that we don't overlook the crucifixion before celebrating the resurrection. How many of y'all know that without the crucifixion for sin, there is no remission of sin? Without the crucifixion for sin, there is no remission of sin. There has to be a dying that takes place first. There has to be a sacrifice that takes place first. In the Old Testament, we know that. There was all types of different sacrificial giving in order to restore our relationship with God. So there is nothing that's new here. There's no changes that has taken place. There must be a sacrifice. There must be a crucifixion before the remission can take place. And so when I think about all that he has endured on that day, just for me, just for you, just for us, I can't help but give him my best praise. I, I don't know if I can shout loud enough. I don't know if I can dance hard enough. I don't know if I can sing loud enough, even though I'm one of the worst singers you'll ever hear. But I, I, I believe that I can't do it enough for him because of what he has done. And so with that, I want to take a few minutes and I want to just kind of summarize and go over some of the pain and the agony that he went through so it draws in how deep his love is and how passionate he truly is for us. Can y'all handle this for a few minutes? Y'all bear with me for a few minutes because this really says a lot about his love for me. And so I think about when it all began 
and, and when the, the persecution began, they, they used what was called a flagrum. I wish I had pictures of it, but it's basically a miniature whip that you hold in your hand. It has these leather straps on it. And on the end of those leather straps, they have these little balls at the end of it, and that's where the pain truly comes from. And they wail these straps and these balls onto his back, lash after lash after lash. They bruised him and bruised him, back and legs. And it was only intended to just cut the skin. But because it was Jesus and their hatred for him was at such a level, let's just say they got a little carried away. As the blows continued, they cut deeper into his tissue, damaging his veins, the veins of his skin, and suffering internal bleeding, and then became external bleeding from vessels in his underlying muscles, and he was nearly dead just from that. I need y'all, just from that part of it, he nearly died. Can y'all hear me out there? Just that part of it alone, he was near death. But he stayed strong because his passion for us. Come on, somebody. Y'all y'all missing it. He stayed strong because his passion for us was so great that he knew that my work is not finished. This hurts, and I'm almost dead, but my passion, I know that I got to get to the cross in order for it to be completed. Hallelujah. How many of y'all know obedience is greater than sacrifice? Yes. So he was obedient to the cross. He had to endure long enough to get there. He wasn't at the cross yet. He was already about to die. But his passion is what kept him alive and what kept him going. We think we're passionate sometimes, don't we? Until we really look at what he had to go through and what he had to subject himself to, what he had to convince himself, I got to keep going. Through all of this pain, through all this turmoil, through all this hurt, I got to keep going. So then they placed the crown of thorns on his head, of thorns on his head, and the crown was pressed into his scalp, again causing massive bleeding as the thorns pierced the vascular tissue in his head. And then after mocking him and striking him across the face, the soldiers took the stick from his hand and struck him across the head driving the thorns even deeper into the scalp. But he didn't die because there was some passion in him that says, I gotta endure this so that I can make it to the cross. Are y'all getting this? I just want y'all to just, just bear with me for a little bit longer because I, even myself, I get so caught up in the fact that he rose that and I just want to rise up too, but sometimes I forget what he did to get to that point. And I just want to take a moment just so we can recognize what he endured. So dehydrated and hungry and suffering from shock, from losing so much blood, he had to carry a cross that weighed more than him for 650 yards to Golgotha. And he fell time and time again, time and time again. He just kept falling. And every time he fell, that cross fell on him, further weakening him, further piercing his skin, further inflicting more bloodshed, further weakening him, causing him to go into even deeper shock. But his passion, his passion for us to have the opportunity for eternal life was so great that he said, I can't die here. I can't stop here. I've got to get up. And he continued to what? Get up. Significantly weaker than he was in the beginning of the torture, he still found enough passion to get up and continue. Are y'all with me today? Yes. They offered him wine and to drink once he was up on the cross because they knew that and back in those days, they would give that to those that are there, that they're crucifying because it would like numb some of the pain and kind of take their mind off of you know. Same reason why a lot of people drink today is 
feel like it numbs pain. That was the mindset then, is that it's to numb some of the pain. But he says, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. I don't want the wine. I was sent to endure this. So don't try to pacify what you're doing. I'm going to endure this because there's a bigger picture. My passion for those that love me, my passion for those that don't love me is so great that you're not going to tamper with my testimony. Y'all better get this. Oh, my God. So he said, no, I don't want the wine. You're not going to cheat me out of this moment. Amen? So now these up on the cross, they had to nail him to us. So they put these nails about five to seven inches. They drove him through his palms. And traditionally, they would drive it through the wrist. But this is Jesus, so they treated him a little differently. They had the option of tying his feet to the cross. And this is all stuff I just learned, that when they crucified people, they actually could tie their feet to the cross. They didn't have to nail it. But because it was Jesus, they chose to nail it instead of tying it. Y'all seeing the hatred towards him and how they chose the most excruciating manner when he had the option of choosing the lesser. But yet he endured that. So now he's hanging up here, being mocked. Now we gotta remember also he's outside, so there's opportunity for, you know, there's insects and all these other things that are coming around and messing with his flesh. He's up here, I'm just giving you a visual of what he went through for us so that way we can celebrate the resurrection a little differently. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So to alleviate the pain in his arms, he had to push himself upward and put all his body weight on the nail that was driven between his feet. So there was really no way out of pain. He just had to choose the lesser of the two. So he had to push up and put all his weight pressure on the nail that's driven through his feet just to give his arms a break. Because his arms and shoulders were dislocating and his wrists and his elbows were dislocating. And so the only way that he would be able to get a little bit of oxygen into his lungs was he had to endure this pain by pushing upward so that his rib cage could open, his lungs could open so he can get just a little bit of air. Hours of pain, hours of turmoil, hours of obedience, and hours of true love. How can it all go together? Hours of pain, hours of turmoil, hours of obedience, and hours of true love. So this is what I think about when I say give God a shout of praise. That's the thought process behind me saying give him a shout of praise because see, there is so much pain and so much love that he had to endure all at the same time and he did it just for us. And he went through all of that so that we, as incomplete people, can have a complete assurance. And I believe that now we should live in peace because of this and peace can only be made through the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ. And if there's to be peace, we must make a sacrifice. There's a lot of people who made sacrifices so that we can have peace. And that, just to name a few of them, Martin Luther King, he had to sacrifice himself so that we could have peace in the South. There's a Nelson Mandela who had to sacrifice himself in South Africa so they could have peace. There's so many people that we can talk about, but the truth of the matter is that without a sacrifice, there is no peace. Sacrifice is how you change the world. If you're not willing to sacrifice, you're not willing to make a difference. And there's people right now with a lot of turmoil in their life, not willing to make a sacrifice to change it. So they continue on with life with the same turmoil that they had before. Sacrifice is the door opener for all sorts of peace and blessing. We have to be willing to do that. Now, What does it look like? It's different for everyone. Some people have to sacrifice on different, everyone sacrifices on a different level, but there is a sacrifice that we have to make in order to ensure that we live the life that he intended for us to make. Because see, everybody will follow Jesus to the blessing, but none went with him to the cross. Y'all remember that? He had 12 disciples. 
he had plenty in his crew. And as long as he was doing miracles and healing people and everything else, as long as he was doing all that, the disciples was on board. But when it went time for him to go to the cross, how many went with him? None. Because we'll go with him for the blessing, but won't go with him for the sacrifice. But the sacrifice is where the shackles are broken. Amen? So is anybody thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus? So here, here we are. We're talking about the sacrifice. We're talking about the downside. You know, the side that we don't really want to talk about. The, the gruesome side. You know, everybody think about, well, I got to go to eat after this. After Peter told me all this stuff. I get it. I don't want to mess your stomachs up. But yeah, this is the reality of it. We cannot live a resurrection life without a crucifixion experience. We can't do it. And if you believe that, then there's, there, that's a prosperity doctrine that I don't teach. I don't teach that. You can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. You cannot reap without sowing. You cannot withdraw without depositing. You cannot get without giving. You cannot expect a return without investing. And you cannot have without a sacrifice. Let me get two or three people to say, you can't have it unless you sacrifice for it. You can't have it unless you sacrifice for it. So when you're about your father's business, you'll not let anything get in the way, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how discouraging it may look, no matter how many folks tell you that what you're doing makes absolutely no sense. Why are you building this boat? This big old huge boat. And it's sunny outside. Sometimes God will call us to do things that make absolutely no sense in the moment. But how many of y'all know when the rain came, everybody came knocking? Hey Noah, you got some room for me? <laughs> he was willing to make the sacrifice in the face of all those people who ridiculed him for doing something that made absolutely no sense. In 1 Peter 5, 10, it says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you after you have suffered a little while. A lot of times we want God to establish us and confirm us and restore us and we never poured out anything. Maybe that's just me. I'm sorry. Sometimes I got to learn how to keep some things to myself. I, I be thinking it's something for everybody else, but it, it's just me. I want God to restore me, but I haven't poured anything out. But then I came across this scripture that says in 1 Peter 5.10, that says, after you have suffered a little while. So now I have to recognize that I'm no greater than Jesus. Even his son, whom he's well pleased, had to suffer a little while. <laughs> before God himself restored him and confirmed and strengthened and established him. He made a promise that if you carry your cross, crucify your flesh daily, that he will personally see to it that you are restored, confirmed, strengthened, and established. You cannot be restored by God and not have a powerful ministry. Whatever your ministry is, I'm not saying you have to be up here to have a ministry. You don't have to be the leader of the praise team to have a ministry. Sometimes your smile is a ministry. Come on, somebody. When God restores you, whatever it is he has called you to do and to be, it's going to be powerful. And it's going to live beyond your years. But we have to get to that place where we crucify the flesh so that he can restore us so that we can get to that place. So here we are, today is resurrection day and I'm just so grateful that he got up. Is anybody grateful that he got up? Yes. He got up. 
Last year, I preached a message about him getting up, and my emphasis was on him getting up, but I didn't talk enough about the resurrection and the crucifixion, so I wanted to kind of switch it up a little bit and build up to that place. But I'm so grateful that he got up, that he defeated death, and now he lives in us so that we can defeat death also. His ministry is so powerful, even to this very day. I recall a time when his disciples was afraid to die when they were in the boat. Do you not care if we live or die? Y'all remember that when the waves and the storm came? See, they haven't had a crucifixion experience yet. So they were afraid to die. But then after he got up, now they say, to die is gain. You don't get that revelation unless you've had an experience of crucifixion. Mm -hmm. But I'm just grateful that he got up for us. Let us not forget that what he did, it was to defeat sickness, to defeat all types of ailments, it was to defeat resentment, it was defeat anger. It was defeat all types of things that will kill us. He defeated all of it. Cancer. Come on, somebody. He defeated it. AIDS. He defeated it. Sickle cell. He defeated it. Come on, somebody. Depression. He defeated it. He defeated all these things at the cross. So when you see somebody that's going through, that is your opportunity to remind them that it's been defeated. It has been defeated. It may be in you right now, but it will not consume you. See, this is what we got to remember. See, that God is a sovereign God, and I don't ever try to tell you this, that, or the third other than what he tells me to say. But death cannot hold you down. That I do know. So whether he choose to heal you on this side of the earth or on that side of the earth, can I just say thank you for healing me? See, a lot of people start losing their, their, their hope in the Lord because they saw someone who died from something. And all of a sudden, their thought process is, why did he heal? Meanwhile, they're up in heaven rejoicing and dancing, doing backflips. Come on, somebody. Oh, they're healed. You didn't get to see it, but that don't mean they weren't healed. It's because you didn't see it. He might look at you and say, well, who are you? Can I just be real with y'all for a minute? You asked me to heal him, and I heal him, but I chose to do it this way. A lot of times, people can become our idol. Oh, don't let me get there. No, I don't want to start. Let me, let me, I don't want to go there. But we got to get to the place where we crucify our flesh. We get to the place where we crucify our flesh, that's when we get to a place where we get to know him. It's not until that we have the crucifixion experience that we have an opportunity to know who our Father in heaven truly is. If you want to get to know him based on your understanding, you'll never get to know him. If you want to get to know him based on not changing, this is who I am. Y'all know this is how God made me, and, and he knew this, and so this is who I am, and I, I want to get to know him based on how I want to get to know him. You'll never get to know him. You'll, you'll be frustrated your entire life thinking that he's not, he not hearing my prayers. Oh, you haven't heard his command. I want him to hear my prayers, but he wants you to hear his command. And so what I want to say here is, first of all, he got up for every last one of us in here. So whatever you may be battling with, whatever you may be struggling with, you must know that when Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished. And if you believe it, then you better receive it. And you better know that it's not coming back. True enough, you may see it, but just because you see something doesn't mean it is not defeated. Just because you see something does not mean that it's not defeated. I always say this, don't ever let your sight affect your vision. See, because your sight, he said don't walk by that, doesn't he? He said don't walk by your sight, he said walk by faith. Walk by vision, walk by faith. Because if you walk by sight, you're gonna be discouraged every day the rest of your life. There may be someone in here today that has not crucified their flesh. Now this is not, a, this is not about giving your life to Christ. This is about 
haven't crucified the flesh. Because there's a whole lot of folks that says, I believe, but still live their life as if they don't. Y'all, y'all, come on. That's another message. But there's someone in here that has not crucified their flesh and said, Lord, not my way, but your way. With all the lashes, all the pain, which is pride. Now, come on, pride makes it a painful experience. With all the pride that is in me, not my way, but have your way. Too often we come to church to get something instead of coming to church to get rid of something. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And, and, and I'm, not going, I'm not saying this in a condemning format, but what I am saying, it's all right to come to church to get a word. But if you get a word and then you leave with strongholds, I still believe in the power of the altar. When I come to church, I come to get rid of something. And I do want to receive, but I also want to get rid of something. I don't want to leave out here with extra baggage that I shouldn't have. So can we be authentic today? Can we, can we be real with one another today? If you're struggling with something, forgiveness, alcoholism, drug abuse. I got to stay back here. So that if you're struggling with lust, if you're struggling with gossip, slander, resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness, today is the day that you need to crucify it and nail it to the cross. I want to see Jesus for real. I want to see him move in my life for real. Don't you want to see him move for real in your life? Come on, somebody. I mean, for real. Like, I want to see signs, miracles, and wonders. But I know that if I'm holding on to some ungodly things, there's no coexistence there, is it? If you want to see him move in your life for real, and you know that you have something in you that you're holding on to that is that could easily keep you from seeing him move in your life. Today is the day to nail it to the cross. Today is the day to nail it to the cross because see, after you've suffered a little while, see that suffering that we're talking about, because it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to get up and say, I'm battling with this, this, and this. Pride will say, no, I can handle it on my own. I don't have to go to no altar. I don't have to admit nothing in front of God. I can just go home and all I gotta do is change a couple of things that I do daily and it'll, it'll work itself out. See, that's nothing but pride. Causing yourself more affliction. But if that's you today, if you have something that you need to crucify, come on up to the altar. I don't know what it is, I don't care what it is, but bring it to the altar. I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Because we all have something that needs to be nailed to the cross. We all have that one thing that needs to be nailed to the cross. And the Bible says that after we nail it to the cross, after we crucify it, God himself will reestablish us. In other words, we'll become like new. We'll come better than before. So we don't have to learn how to function in our mess. We've gotten really good at learning how to function in mess, amen? Am I the only one that's learned how to function? But he called us to prosper, not function. And in order for us to get to that place where we prosper, we have to nail some things to the cross so that we can reestablish us. Is there anybody here today that needs prayer? Anybody here today that needs to bring their issues through? I don't have to, you can come up here by yourself. I'm not one of those pastors that believe that, that it has to come through me to get to him. But I believe in the power of the altar. I believe in it. I totally, I totally believe in it. If there's anyone here today that needs prayer, or if you want to come to the altar and pray to the Lord himself, it is open. The opportunity is open. Amen. God is good. God is good. I believe in it. I believe in it. I believe in it. Amen. I believe in it. 
See, because if there was no power in the altar, they would have never built altars to worship God. I just follow the blueprint, y'all. I don't make up, I don't try to make up nothing. So I'm going to give them a moment and allow them to pray. And those of you who don't need it or don't have it in you right now, that's fine. But can you intercede for somebody who does? Get seats wherever you're standing. You pray for these individuals that are up here. Can you pray for them? There's power in intercessory prayer. Is there anyone here who has not given their life to Christ and recognize the need for salvation, recognize what he has done to give you the opportunity for eternal life, but you have not made that confession. If that's you, if you are here today, if you've been born to church but never confessed him as your Lord and Savior, you just intended, but you can actually give your life to the Lord today and be counted in the book of life. Is there anyone here today that has not given your life to the Lord? You want to do so today? Today is the day that, that being in agreement with ungodly things will be broken. Today is the day that all hurts and fears will be broken. And that we will start standing on God's promises. Because he hasn't let us down. He has never let us down. Pray, folks. This is no longer about us. This is all about deliverance. This is about being set free. You may know somebody in your world, in your circle, that needs to be set free. You can pray for them from where you're sitting. He can do all things. He can take a Saul and cause him to be one of the most powerful apostles known to man. A man who used to crucify and persecute Christians, if he can take him and change him to be one who won the souls of thousands and thousands of people, if he can do that to him, he can do that to someone who struggles with drug addiction. Oh yeah, I believe him to do it. I believe him to do it. peace that surpasses all understanding. He is our provider. And sometimes we don't think that he does because he doesn't move when we want him to move. But he is moving. He is moving. And if you just suffer just a little while, come on somebody. struggling, they are not strong enough to even come and see about you. They're not strong enough to pray for themselves. And so right now, Father, we intercede for them. Lord, we just believe that you will start doing a mighty work in their hearts, in their surroundings. Lord, the things that are not like you, I pray, become a nasty taste in their mouth and that it would turn their hearts away from it, Father, and turn towards you. I, I just believe you to start surrounding people with godly influences, Father, and that everywhere they turn, that they're seeing your truth, Lord, and that your word, because we know it's alive, Lord, that it begins to manifest in their lives, Lord, because we know that you are a God of healing. You are a God of joy. And Lord, restore joy. Somebody needs joy restored. Lord, restore joy to your people. 